Well, thank you everyone for coming to No Lake County. Today we have Rafael Valdez and Alex Suhan. And Alex, or Rafael tells me Alex taught him everything he knows, that he is the king of walnuts. So they're going to give us a presentation. But before we get started, I, I just wanted to say a few words um, for the Friends of the Library. They donate all the um, snacks for us today. and. They donate books and money for other things for us. They're a great organization. If you want to join, you can. <coughs> also, if you want to fill out a program of evaluation, that lets me know what you guys would like to have. We still have some openings for, we have four openings for the rest of the year for No Lake County. If you know anybody who knows anything about Lake County and would like to volunteer to, to do that. Also, the April newsletter is back there. And I wanted to um, let you know next weekend, next Saturday at this time, we're going to start a new monthly program. Um, we got screening rights to the Lincoln Center for Performing Arts. We'll be doing different kinds of programs where we're going to show them on the big screen. Um, we're going to do Showboat next weekend. But there's some interviews, there's music, there's artists, there's um, all kinds of different programs that will be coming. We've updated our internet to accommodate that, and so that'll be fun to have too. So. Is it live? No, it's recorded. <laughs> um, no, but it, it's not the old movie of Showboat. It's oh no, it's a it's a stage production. Some singers on the stage, and then a, a, a orchestra behind them. So it, it's stage production. Yeah of Showboat. It's not the old movie. And, and Lincoln Center does do things. So I think Showboat was from last year that they did it. Okay. So it's either all of the programs are from about a year ago to close to the present. So And it'll be fun. Um, all kinds of different things coming up. So we're going to invite Alex up. He's going to start our program off. Since he's the king, we'll let him come first. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I uh, got a lot of stuff here, but I'm not very well prepared. In fact, I'm not prepared well at all. <laughs> but uh, I am here. <laughs> and uh, so um, I've been here in Lake County since 1943. And uh, when we came to Lake County, the ranch that we uh, bought had a few walnut trees down the driveway, and, and so I had a little experience uh, growing walnuts since 1943. Um, in the old days, most everybody around the north end of the county there, out of Upper Lake, had uh, um, a few walnut trees, and uh, they paid the taxes. Taxes weren't very high in those days. And so it, that's, uh, that's kind of what people planned on. So anyhow, um, walnuts originated in uh, what they call Persia, which is, we call it Iran. And uh, um, they grew wild there, and uh, they were spread all over the country um, from there. Um, the Carpathian Mountain Range, there's some walnuts growing along the edge of that, uh, and where they're uh, in, in real cold places, the cold hardy varieties kind of come from there. So, uh, um, and we of course call them English walnuts, but uh, one year we, I took a trip, my wife and I, to the uh, East Coast, and uh, went up into Canada and had an acquaintance there that grew some walnuts. And um, there everyone calls them Persian walnuts. They don't call them English walnuts. They call them Persian walnuts. And uh, so, uh, so anyway, that's where they came from. And uh, so uh, they, uh, the world travelers uh, took some to South America and uh, and got them established there, and the um, in the, about the 1870s or 1770s, 
the mission fathers uh, brought them to California and uh, uh, from South America. So they got some started in uh, Southern California. Um, and in 1969, Joseph Sexton purchased a sack of walnuts at the dock on San Francisco and planted a thousand trees at his ranch at Goleta, Goleta, wherever that is. I guess that's the Southern California someplace. Yeah. Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara. Right? a thousand trees there. Um, and they, the, the, whoever wrote that believes that the origin was Chile or China. Chile is growing quite a few walnuts right now, and they're quite high quality. They have the right climate and soils, and they, they're pretty high quality. And uh, so anyway, uh, in the old days, everybody went out and just planted the English walnuts out in the field, and so each tree was actually a separate variety. <coughs> um, as you, I don't know if you know or not, but uh, um, most all fruits and nuts, um, almonds and pistachios and, and um, cherry trees and peach trees and walnut trees, all are now grafted onto rootstock. And if you, there's certain situations, very few, that the English rootstock is uh, the preferred rootstock. So they plant English walnuts and then they graft them anyway to the variety they want. Otherwise, uh, if you plant the English walnut in place, each and every tree is a different variety. And uh, so they'll leave out a different time. They'll uh, they'll grow, have different characteristics. They'll they'll harvest at a different time, and the quality will be each one will be different. So, and uh, so that's um, not the way we do it anymore. Um, the Chinese uh, had quite a few walnuts early on, and what they did, they went out and just stuck the uh, English walnut uh, in the ground wherever they had a spot they couldn't grow the rice or whatever crop. They stick an English walnut so. Every tree they had was a different variety. And, um, we have a question. Why are they different if they're coming from the same tree? Because the genetics, uh, the genetics are different. Because okay. they're uh, um, have different, each nut may could possibly have different pollen parent and different combination of genes. Okay. And so they, uh, so that's why, as they say, all the cherry trees and almond trees and pistachio trees are all grafted or budded onto rootstocks. And, um, uh, and that way you get the whole orchard um, leaves out the same time and harvests the same time and has, uh, each tree has similar quality. Um, there in China, they, as they say they planted a, quite a bunch of walnuts and they, as they planted an English walnut wherever they had a spare piece of ground that they couldn't use for anything else. and. Um, so the harvest time, you couldn't go out and systematically harvest the crop because each and every tree was different. <laughs> so what they did, I understand way back then, uh, they would harvest, shake the nuts off the trees when the nuts were pretty mature, and they put them out and spread them out in the field and cover them with the leaves and the straw and stuff and kind of compost them to where the point the holes came off. <laughs> and so you can imagine the quality of that crop, it was pretty bad. <laughs> but um, uh, here in the last, uh, oh, what, 25 years or so, China has planted a lot of walnuts, and they're using rootstocks, and they're using our California varieties that they swiped or caught out of the <laughs> <laughs> California, so they're, they're in the walnut business pretty strong. Um, so, So anyway, about 19, 1870, Felix Gillette, at, uh, a nurseryman at Nevada City, was importing cyanwood um, and plants from France. Felix Gillette is uh, called the, the father of the walnut industry in, in Northern California. And uh, he was pretty active in uh, uh, getting cyanwood and plants out of France, and that's where the uh, Frankette variety came from, and the various Mayettes, and, and a number of other ones. And um, so anyhow, 
Um, and then um, uh, Oscar Poe, who was a Lake County guy, uh, lived in Scott Valley. Uh, he was the first Walnut well, Orchard Lake guy. Um, well, no, I better not back up on that. I'm not sure he had the first Walnut Orchard Lake guy. A. A. Wheeler had a uh, Walnut Orchard below, below Canoc Dye Bay, which I guess was the first orchard. But Oscar Poe was quite active uh, with uh, Felix Gillette, uh, getting different own varieties. To, and uh, so he named one of them for himself, Poe, and uh, uh, it there's quite a lot of it around um, Upper Lake in you know, Scotts Valley. There's not much in Kelseyville or, or Lower Lake area. Um, in uh, there was quite a rush after the war to plant walnuts in Lake County, and, and quite most of it in the 40s, mid 40s, late 40s, were planted on the uh, Red Hills uh, down there, uh, where the big uh, Beckstopper Vineyard is now um, east of um, Kitts Corner and, and on the south side of the highway. That was all walnuts at one time. And um, it was, had been cleared, uh, I guess most of it by Walter Reichert and some of his partners uh, and one of the walnuts there. So there were several hundred acres there. And uh, so they did pretty well. Um, there around uh, the valley in Lake County here, there was quite a lot of walnut planting started in the early 50s. We planted our first orchard in 1952, and so we've been planting a few ever since. Um, so that's about all I'm going to get off of that card. <laughs> <coughs> I've got here the, uh, from the Ag Commissioner, I got the California Walnut Production by County, and uh, Lake County uh, produced something like 1,466 uh, tons this last year. Wow. Uh, way back in the early 50s, as I recall, uh, the state of California produced something like uh, 30,000 tons, which we thought was a lot of walnut. And now, California produces right at 700,000 tons. Wow. And that's a, that's a lot of walnut. And uh, they've been s selling quite well. Um, the newer varieties, some of them are, are quite profitable. They are very high quality. Um, one of the main determinations of quality is what the kernel, color of the kernel. And, um, so the, the one that's probably about half of the state production now is that variety, is called the Chandler. And um, it has very light kernel, kernel, kernel color, and um, it's quite productive, and, um, and it shells easily. They can get uh, half kernels out easily. Some of the variety, like the old Franquette, um, all you get is a little bunch of slivers and bits and pieces, and that doesn't bring the money that the not big calves that do. So the handlers of uh, the handlers really love to have a, a bin full of chandlers sitting around there, and they can make some real money. And um, generally, in the export market in the past, uh, they only exported either walnuts in shell that they would sell to the customer in shell, or they were already shelled. But um, um, here lately, the Chinese have been importing Chandler's in shell, and then they hand crack them. And you probably know that, that if you buy shell walnut kernels in California, they look like they went through a cement mixer. You know, <laughs> corner knocked off of them and everything. So, so uh, uh, anyway, the Chandler variety comes out in halves, and of course halves is where the big money is too. And so the channel is very easy to get to have, and they're very light color. And I'm not quite sure why light color is so important, but it is a big factor in, in pricing of walnuts to the grower and the customer. So uh, 
that the Chandler really shines there. And it's quite a, <coughs> the Chandler variety is quite productive as well as being very high quality. Um, it can produce uh, well, three tons of the acre in such a manner where the old pole variety, if you get a ton of the acre, you're really doing good. And the old pole variety only has about 35, 36% kernel, the rest of its shell, and the Chandler is crowding 50% kernel. So it, um, the people that are getting three tons of the acre, and here a couple of years ago, they were getting, the grower was getting right at $2 a pound. So there was some real money coming in, but uh, then the price went down. Uh, they had a, somewhat of an oversupply here a couple of years ago. They couldn't sell them all, so the price went down about half. So and that was inching back a little bit. So uh, anyhow, let me see. So then I guess the next thing, I, um, let's see that. I tell you that Lake County has something like 1,466 um, tons of walnuts this year. And last year was 1479, so that's about where we are uh, on production. Uh, oh, I should tell you, uh, Lake County walnuts are, are very, um, um, are quite good in several respects. One is that this climate, uh, this uh, elevation apparently, and temperatures uh, cause them to have three light kernels. Out in the Sacramento and Alleghany Valley, sometimes it's a doggone hot that the kernels turn dark and um, they just don't have the light col color. But, so we always have pretty much light color. And uh, also we have very little uh, insect problem. We have, um, um, in, the, in the Sacramento Valley, they have a terrible problem with worms in the walnut. They have the, the calling moth and they have the, another one called naval orange worm, which is a real problem. And um, just about everybody in the valley has to have a great big speed sprayer like you see the Gregor was using. It costs thirty, forty thousand dollars if you buy a new one. And they're out there spraying all the time for these uh, insects where we don't have those insects in the county at all, period. Uh, they just don't like it here. <laughs> so we're pretty fortunate there. We do have other problems. We sometimes have a lot of rain during harvest. <laughs> and we, like this year, we had how much? Uh, 10 inches or much better. And, and I guess some of the growers didn't even get their walnuts harvested ever. They just couldn't get at it. It just it was all wet. And it uh, detracts to the quality when it gets a lot of rain. Yeah, another question. When you were talking about the weight of the walnuts, that we produce is that in the shell or out of the shell? Uh, in shell. And what's the percentage of shell weight to? Well, the uh, the Chandler variety, as I say, it crowds 50 percent kernel, and the old Bo variety runs uh, 35 or 36 percent kernel. Franquette runs uh, what 42 or such a matter. The Hartley is about the same, 42, 45. It varies year to year, but uh, the Hartley, which Lake County had a lot of. Uh, is the pro premier in shell variety that they sell in the retail stores in shell. But the problem with it is that uh, we have a lot of them here in Lake County, but the problem is they have a, a disease that's unique to them only called deep black canker. And it, it kills major limbs in the trees and eventually kills the whole tree. So um, 30 years or so and they start going downhill pretty fast. Mm -hmm. They are fantastic. <coughs> <coughs> Fantastic variety for, for the in jail market, but uh, so now the uh, the university has developed what they call Howard that they're using quite a bit for the in jail market. And they have a, uh, another new one that they just released um, that's supposed to be real good in jail walnut. Uh, <coughs> hmm? When you were talking about quality, um, uh, what about the in terms of taste, in terms of uh, what people prefer and the taste of walnuts, oh. is there, uh, would you talk a little bit about uh, the walnuts we grow here and, and can you, is there a difference in the taste? Um, some people believe there is, but uh, uh, a lot of people believe that the Po is the best tasting walnut in the whole world, but uh, personally, it, uh, uh, I haven't noticed 
any real difference that I could tell. Um, but, you know, I'm kind of with my red wine. Uh, they pretty much all taste the same. Because <laughs> 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 so I'm good one guy at all. <laughs> and uh, so the walnuts are pretty much that way with me, too. But, uh, well, some walnuts have like a tannin, you know, kind of an aftertaste. You know, you know, the brinkettes are pretty bad with that. Uh, I, um, as far as the flavor, I have a preference. <laughs> it has to do with the percentage of the kernel in the shell. The Poe has the best flavor, the Chandler has the least. You know, you get a 20-year-old Chandler and a 6-year-old Franquette, and the Franquette will outtaste it every time. That's, you know, yeah. and again, those, 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 um, the Franquettes and the Mayettes probably have that more tannic flavor, you know, that little tongue tingling to them, mm -hmm. but uh, for me, the Chandlers don't have any flavor. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't know. I, I uh, know a group of fellows from uh, Mendocino County and San Francisco that are connoisseurs of walnut flavors, yeah. and they you know, have an awful time with them. They sometimes uh, uh, believe that uh, the Chandler has a good, real good flavor, so I don't know. Um, I know one year that I had a... Uh, on the North Coast Walnut Association board meeting, uh, we had, I cracked a bunch of different varieties and put them on dishes and didn't have them named that they could see. And uh, pretty much everyone decided that the Howard had the best flavor. So, but, yeah, me. And then the, my daughter insists that the red walnut is uh, got the best flavor. There, there is a walnut at the university, um, they've got some uh, uh, red uh, skinned, red uh, pellable uh, variety walnut from France that wasn't very productive, and they crossed it with, with the Howard variety, and they got way more productivity, and they uh, uh, released that, and uh, so my daughter thinks that's the best flavored walnut, so I don't know. Yeah. What's the official name for that red walnut? Livermore. Livermore. Yeah. Um, Robert Livermore, they named that walnut. They, uh, Robert Livermore was a, a big, uh, com uh, well, he was a big University of California Berkeley guy, and he was on the rowing team, and he was big in that. And uh, he donated a bunch of money to the UC Davis to uh, publish a book on walnut varieties, and so he um, died suddenly, and they decided they better name him. All of that. Name the red Robert Livermore. Yeah. So, anyhow, um, but anyway, Lake County has uh, very little um, insect problem. We do have one that's pretty serious, and that's called the walnut husk fly, and it's a fruit fly that that eats on the uh, hull of the walnut. And if it attacks the tree pretty early in the summer, it'll cause the kernel to shrivel real bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it doesn't attack them early but hits them late, uh, it'll just discolor the shell. And so then if you're uh, trying to sell the walnuts in the shell, um, that won't work. you got to have a pretty shell. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, Lake County, as I say, has, uh, well, we don't have those big spray rigs that people in the valley have and the ferrores have, because we just don't have to do that kind of work. And, uh, so and we, we do have some drawbacks here too, as I said before, the, the big rain during harvest is a real problem. And then oftentimes in the spring, about the last week of April, we get a big frost that, that kills the crop and then we're out of business for a year. So we do have our drawbacks. But um, so anyway, somewhere here I have a <coughs> story, I believe, of information on the um, on the organic walnut, because uh, there is quite a quite a little um, demand for organic walnut, and the price sometimes has been uh, pretty good compared to the regular price, and other times it has not. So, uh, so we have as I say, a minimum of, of insects. Uh, so we don't really have a big problem controlling insects. Uh, 
Well, that's why I say is the is the one, that, and uh, getting on your nitrogen fertilizer, uh, that's pretty uh, difficult to find anything organic for that. <coughs> so um, anyhow, there's something like uh, in in Lake County organic, something like uh, 1,598 acres in uh, organic walls of Lake County, okay. and. Um, there's probably going to be quite a bit more because uh, some of the big processors or big buyers and handlers of walnuts uh, quit coming to Lake County because uh, we have a lot of small, small orchards and uh, small lots of walnuts of five or six bins or you know, partial truckloads and they don't like to run their trucks all the way over here for a partial load so they, they quit coming so uh, quite a few of those people are planning on going organic, so there may be quite an increase in organic people. So there's, a, there's 42 farms that are growing organic walnuts. And uh, so, so anyway, um, so marketing walnuts with each, see we've got something like 700,000 tons this year, and I believe that the people that like to make estimates, think that we got enough trees planted in the ground to uh, produce 770,000 tons, and that's a lot of walnuts. So, um, the uh, walnut growers, uh, many years ago, uh, formed the California Walnut Board and California Walnut Commission, and uh, those are uh, um, supposed to market walnuts. And uh, <coughs> they uh, they charge us the growers a, a, a so much a ton assessment to finance their activities. I've got one uh, one um, grade sheet here that shows seventy thousand pounds, and uh, on that on that uh, bunch of walnuts, I paid um, oh boy. Well, the California Walnut Board assessment was $1,478, so it's quite a bit of pocket change. And then the, uh, uh, the Walnut, uh, California Walnut, uh, Walnut Marketing Board, they got another $706. So, so we're, we're paying our way. And uh, so they've, they've done a lot of work. Uh, you've heard, I'm sure, about all the work about walnuts having a lot of the omega threes in them and being helpful, and uh, so this was all done with the walnut marketing board or, uh, or walnut commission uh, money. Um, we um, got the uh, Loma Linda University quite a few years ago, twenty some years ago or so, to uh, study the walnuts, and as you probably know, they're very high in omega threes, and they studied them in relationship to heart health, and they came up with a study that showed that they were all really, really um, was good for the heart. And uh, so that's been one of their main um, selling points all over the world, uh, selling walnuts. And uh, so um, so we're getting money back on our investment. <laughs> um, and then they, uh, they, they have ongoing uh, studies on all kinds of phases of the nutrition. Of walnuts, and uh, you know the uh, the walnut people were the first ones to uh, study the nutrition thing, and the rest of them all decided, well, we better get into that too. And so they're all advertising that they're heart healthy and all that. But um, the other nuts, almonds and pistachios, uh, have very, very, very low of any omega threes. Walnuts are the big ones, and uh, that's one reason why if you keep walnuts around too long, they turn rancid because omega threes or what goes rancid, <laughs> so you want to keep them in the freezer, so, so anyhow, okay, well now, I think I've come to the end okay. of my stuff. Uh, oh, the uh, Walnut um, Commission, or Walnut Marketing, uh, Walnut Commission, I guess it is, they also uh, do a lot, of, a lot of money to the uh, University of California uh, researchers for uh, uh, programs to to treat insects 
problems better or all kinds of problems. They're studying uh, nutritional tree nutrition and uh, uh, pruning and irrigation and all kinds of things with the, with the money that we give them. And so they, they do a lot, of, a lot of work. I understood a few years ago that they were working on a genetically modified walnut. What variety is that? And are there any in Lake County growing? Um, they have not done any GMO stuff to the walnut industry. Okay. They do a lot of hybridizing, mm -hmm. um, but just plain conventional, conventional uh, work is not classified uh, okay. as GMOs at all. But um, so anyway, there is a lot of a lot of studies of the uh, uh, insecticides and fungicides and and pruning techniques and all sorts of things uh, that they're studying all the time. Mm. Very bad. You mentioned China. Where does California fit into the overall production of, of walnuts today? I didn't get the whole question. How large of a producer is California walnuts uh, on the world market? Oh, California is the main supplier of walnuts in the world. Um, uh, China grows quite a few, but they can eat them all. <laughs> <laughs> so usually they uh, they buy some of ours. Uh, some years, <coughs> if they have to have a big crop, they don't uh, buy any from us. But uh, uh, I understand that a big part of the uh, region where they grow walnuts in China is somewhat like Lake County. They're subject to frost or some other weather conditions, so quite often they don't have full crops, and so when they do, they come to see us. Um, yeah, we export a lot of walnuts to, to uh, um, India and uh, and Turkey and and uh, the European countries, so uh, exporting walnuts is a big deal. I think we export maybe, what, 50, 60 percent of the walnuts that we grow is, uh, is exported. Mm -hmm. When you talked about the walnuts came from Persia, and now all walnuts and the other stone fruits that you talked about are on rootstock, we always call that the English walnut. Did the English walnut come from Persia, and then people just called it English walnut? I don't know how they decided to call it English walnut. Okay. I don't know. And is the rootstock that you talk about from Persia, or is it something we've developed? Uh, no, the, 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 the rootstock. Uh, well, one parent, well, the, the most popular rootstock now is not the black walnut rootstock, it's a hybrid of black walnut and English walnut. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, called Paradox Hybrid. And uh, I guess Luther Burbank was the first one to rec recognize it as being a, a better rootstock. And uh, so um, that uh, is what's mostly used. Mm -hmm. Could you tell us just a little bit about your um, career in walnut breeding? Or what? Your career in walnut breeding? Oh. Well, I haven't done any walnut breeding. Uh, <laughs> I uh, planted a lot of trees and grafted a lot of trees. And, and uh, um, I grafted in the first walnut tree in 1948. And so I've grafted for a long time. I'm just in, about now too doggone old to do much anymore. <laughs> I'm uh, 89 years old, and uh, most people are already dead. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't need enough walnuts. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I have, uh, I have done a lot of experimenting, made a lot of mistakes. Uh, a lot of mistakes. Uh, what is the average lifespan of a producing walnut tree? Well, if it's a Hartley variety, it's only 30, 35 years. Mm -hmm. But um, Poe's, uh, we have one little block of them that are, I imagine, about 83 or 4 or 5 years old, and they're just as healthy as they can be. They don't produce very well, because uh, it's just not a very productive variety, but they're strong, healthy trees. So. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about the cycle of the walnut? Because I've lived here 20 some years. Every fall I go and gather walnuts from friends. 
but I've never seen what you would, I would call the flower of the well, walnut, which well, I understand. Well, you right now and you should yeah. see the little flower. So they're, they're not really flowers, they're like catkins or something? Well, the catkin is the male. Mm -hmm. Oh. It's the pollen producing part. Okay. And the... Uh, and the, the little uh, little nutlets are just little bitty guys there, and you need your glasses on to look at those. Mm. And they should be visible on the Hartley variety. May not be visible yet on the Franquettes. I haven't looked, but uh, uh, so uh, so anyway. So they they bloom uh, about now, and then they uh, grow all summer. And well, they grow. They don't grow all summer. Um, about the first of July the tip of the shell begins to harden. So if you get your pocket knife in early July and thereabouts and cut the end of the walnut through the through the hull and you come to a hard hard shell there, they're not growing anymore. Their growth is, is over. Mm -hmm. And so then from then on it's just a matter of the nut maturing and getting its oil content and that kind of stuff. Do when they Okay, so you get the flower and the pollen and all that, and you start to get the walnut. Are they little tiny ones, and then they get oh, yeah, they they're bigger? Just, they're just little bitty things mm -hmm. uh, to begin with, and they, as I say, they, they keep growing until uh, about the first of July, and then they reach full size. And then the inside is what's mature. The inside is developing. And when so I towards the end, they're getting their oil in there. When I pick them in the fall. I always eat a couple, and they're kind of chewy. You know, they're probably, not probably as hard as they're going to be dry. later. And then I put them in front of the fire, and I leave them. And I've even picked, you know, cracked the walnuts three years later, and they're still good. So how long would a walnut probably last if it didn't get rancid? Well... I'm surprised that you're not rented in three years. <laughs> <laughs> now, for the pole variety, they've got a very, very, very strong shell. They got, a, as I say, a big, a high yes, term, a shell percentage, and uh, they uh, they're almost vacuum sealed. <laughs> 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 they, they don't turn around as quickly as some of the other varieties. Okay. But generally speaking, you you should sh put them in the freezer. Once I crack them, I do, but in the shell, yeah. they seem well, to be okay. Well, if you have them in your freezer, you can put them in the shell and all. <laughs> Sometimes when I crack a walnut, it's all black and crunchy inside. And is that the husk fly no, result? No, well, probably not. Uh, the, uh, there's only a certain number of them that are oilless, and they'll be black. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the tree could be stress from lack of moisture or uh, competition from smoke trees or pine trees nearby and, mm. and so they'll tend to have the black mm. kernels. Okay. Yeah? I've had uh, a chance to have some uh, walnut, uh, uh, some recipes made from green walnuts, especially in like a sugary syrup. And then mm. I've also read that you can ferment the green walnuts. Is it possible to buy green walnuts here in the county? I suppose. You get a five dollar bill out and go out and find some. <laughs> in the trailer yard, you can probably get some. Get a flashlight? <laughs> yeah, or get a flashlight, yeah. But is there a market? I mean, are they sold generally? Um, I haven't heard of it. Okay. You mean non-dried non walnuts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're... Uh, they're Not selling. the hydrated. They're just off the kernels. Yeah, they're, uh, uh, some are fermented, but others are in the sugary syrup, and uh, had some in Armenia, which mm -hmm. is in the Caucasus. But when you say so green walnuts, I mean, these like, are not I, I dry. I think these in the, in the husk still. Yeah, so they're yeah. soft, so you can like, just cut them with a butter knife. Uh, oh, in the husk? Yeah. Process. Oh, pickles. Yeah, pickles. You have to get up in the tree well before they fall. When the nuts first fall off the tree, and they're not dry yet, and you want to eat them, you peel the skin off of the kernel. Yeah. But that's where the bitter stuff is. Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about drying walnuts, so how, how, how long they have to dry, and how are they dried, and what temperature? Well, most of us have uh, dehydrators, and we use propane gas and forced air blowing up through the, the, the nuts. We have bins 
with the expanded metal wire bottoms and and the nuts are three four feet deep and you a big old fan in the propane heat and you run this uh, dry air through there and uh, if you're running close to 110 degrees then it take about 30 hours or so to dry depending on how green they were when they were picked if they've been hanging on a tree with a hull split open for a week or two they might be almost dry when you when you harvest them and what does that do for them <coughs> What does drying do for them? Well, keep them from molding. <laughs> yeah, yeah if you don't dry them, they'll pretty much mold. So if you don't have a propane dryer, and like you're putting them by the fireplace yeah. or out in the sun, how long would it take? Well, it might take a week or two. Yeah. And uh, or a couple of weeks maybe, depending on weather. Yeah, you can. A long time. In, the, in the old days, way back in the 1950s, most of us had wire straight, uh, trays of chicken wire made with two, four, two by four frames and, and uh, put nuts on there a couple deep and put them on the front porch or wherever and, and uh, let them sit there for two or three weeks. <coughs> and when you uh, crack them and, and break the kernel and it's crisp, uh, then it's dry. If it's rubbery, it's not dry. Way back. So is the husk, is the husk fly, uh, kind of like a regular, looks like a regular fly with strong pinchers on the front? There are pinchers on the front of it, pinchers on the front. There are fruit flies looking thing with a little uh, <coughs> orange or yellow dot in the middle of their back. And they uh, they come out, uh, oh boy, when? Uh, August or? July, late July. July, late July. Uh, they, uh, the, the female lays the egg in the hull and the little bag is hatch and they crawl around her feeding on the hull. What is there a bug that's commonly on a walnut tree that has really strong pinchers on the front? It looks it kind of has stripes on the on the out on the um, on the back, like a kind of like a wasp, not really like a bee, right. but it's real strong pinchers. They get them, they fall into the pool, and they pinch you. I don't know, so it's maybe earwigs rain crawling around up there. No, these no, they're not. No, these are actually flies with pinchers on the front, oh. and they'll bite you, and they're and they rain off of the tree. Oh. I know they're coming off the walnut those. tree. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that would be. Is there any use for the green hulls that stain so badly? Um, Does anybody recycle them um, into something else? Somebody did. Uh, uh, Snyder one time had a contract with, I think somebody was making suntan lotion or something. Oh. Um, <laughs> And they had a contract to get walnut hulls, uh, but I didn't have any details on that. Because then, you know, turning your fingers all brown. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so. so. Doesn't the Ellis Ranch uh, compost them and sell uh, topsoil? Uh, I believe they do. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, a good a good use for them. Our problem with that, I'd, I'd like to do that myself, but. Our problem is that we harvest our crop with a machine and we have some fields that are quite gravelly. And so our, when the hulls go, <coughs> go out into the pile, they've got a lot of gravel in it. We don't want to compost the gravel, so we feel kind of bad about that. Um, okay. Could you describe how you pick walnuts commercially? Oh boy. Well, we have a a big old machine, if you were to go out and buy a new one, today it costs you $115,000. So we go out and buy second-hand machines for 20000 or so and hope for the best. But what do they do? Well, it's, <coughs> it, uh, it's got big old clamps on the front of it that will clamp a, a tree or a limb that big around and it just shakes the hell out of them <laughs> and they come down and and then we have a sweeper that will sweep them into a windrow so we can make a fairly windrow. And then we have harvesters that are either tractor drawn or self propelled, depending on how much money you want to spend. And they go by there and it picks them up and puts them in the trailer in behind and you take them to the hydrator and run them through the hover and put the propane heat to them. And do most of the growers do their own picking and their 
hydrating and then they sell them. Didn't we used to have hydrators here? Yeah, we, we've had several commercial dehydrators in the county and, um, and most of the bigger growers have got their own dehydrator. So, yeah. <coughs> um, yeah. One of the other things I haven't talked about is the evils of government. <laughs> we've got, we we can't uh, we can't spray anything, any a weed killer or or anything without getting a, uh, having a license with the county ag commissioner. And uh, there are a lot of things that that uh, aren't on the market anymore. If they work real well, they they seem to decide they're dangerous and they pull them off the market. And then we have the food safety people that are run amok. Uh, we, uh, the walnut people got lumped in with the produce people. So, you know, when you've got uh, lettuce or something out in the field, that you don't want to be spraying that lettuce and then eating the lettuce because your level of get died. Well, they've, they've got us walnut guard lumped in with those same people. And the, <coughs> and one that had the protection of the home, and then the gel on there. So I would think that it should be very different. So anyway, we have to, uh, suppose we're supposed to go out in the orchard before harvest and gather up all the turkey poo or the deer poo that's out in the orchard. That, we've got 150 turkeys out there sometimes, and we got 20 or 30 deer out there every night all summer long. We're supposed to go out and gather all that up. So that's a little difficult. We uh, we try to do it, and we do do it some, but uh, get the bugger. And then we have to have our our water tested. They want to make sure our water doesn't have E. coli in it, so we have to test the, the wells that we irrigate with um, four times a year, the first couple of years, and after that, if everything turns out okay, I think twice a year. And uh, so. Um, there's just no end to it. Uh, you can't, you can't have, uh, you can't have your employees eat lunch in the dehydrator. Uh, that's a no-no. You can't have your dog with you, running around the orchard. Um, I talked to some cherry growers that are in the, got the same kind of rules with the cherries, and they can't, not supposed to eat a cherry out in the orchard and spit the seed out. That's a no-no. So. That sounds like a little overkill to me. So. Since you mentioned irrigation, I've heard that many walnut orchards have no irrigation. Um, what, is that an old time uh, practice? or what, what's Well, if you've got deep soil and the trees planted pretty far apart, um, you couldn't get by without irrigation. This is a, one of the block of old poultry that I tell you about is 83 or so years old. Uh, it's never been irrigated, and we don't irrigate it. Uh, the trees are as healthy as they can be. They don't produce much, but uh, they're as healthy as they can be. But, but if you've got an orchard that's producing um, three tons of nuts of the acre, I think pretty much you should have some irrigation on there. Because uh, uh, if you... Uh, you run short of uh, moisture, then the the kernels will be shriveled, and you and you'll get docked on the price when they they uh, determine the price you're going to get. So, so there's a dehydrator and then a dryer. What's the no dehydrator and dryer? Same thing. Same thing. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to show your video, rafting video? I suppose. Okay. Get a little break. <laughs> if we can. Can somebody hit the lights back there? Thank um, you. And so I, I guess I should reiterate or emphasize that that uh, uh, all lemon orchards and peach orchards and cherry orchards are uh, have been budded or grafted. It, it's all got to be done. Otherwise, you'll have uh, a whole bunch of different varieties. Out in the fortune, you can't have um, 50 some different varieties in each acre. So, uh, an exception to that is if you're growing something from cuttings, like grapes, you stick cuttings in the ground, they don't need to be grafted. If you um, grow uh, olives from cuttings, 
They don't have to be grafted. Uh, you can grow pomegranate from cutting, so that doesn't have to be better grafted, but only conventional mainline fruits and nuts, they have to be budded or grafted. So, okay. I'm going to go sit down again. Right. Do we know which one we want to do? The second one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's the top one on that one. Mm -hmm. Dark. 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 Science pieces just about the same diameter as the tree. And the proper procedure is to cut the tree off about a week in advance or 10 days. Um, and uh, I, to, in order for the tree to um, stop bleeding. Bleeding is the problem with walnut trees. And so about a week before graft, we cut the tree off and we put some gashes in it, and uh, which I, in the end here, and so if you, if you put the gashes in a week ago, we'll put some fresh gashes in it today, you see. And we want to go a little ways into the sapwood, and uh, and I should say at this time that the only time that you can successfully whip graft is when you have young trees that are growing very fast, very rapidly. Uh, this tree grew quite well. It was planted last spring. If you plant trees in, a, in an orchard as a replant situation or an interplant situation where the little trees are competing with the old trees, you should l let them get uh, two inches or more in diameter and bark grafting. Whip grafting is only for very, very fast growing situations. And uh, so we're gonna also drill a, a hole in it here uh, to aid in the well, <laughs> and uh, so we uh, we selected a piece of grafting wood, and it has a uh, a prim primary bud and a secondary bud there, and another primary bud and a secondary bud there. So, and you see that piece is just a whisker smaller than that, so it should fit on there pretty good. Um, Make a nice flat cut there, uh, and about two and a half inches long. Uh, different people have different techniques. Some people make a pretty short cut, but I don't make little short cuts very often. So this is about two and a half inches long. And then we make our little cut here. This is called whip or tongue grafting, and that's the tongue right there. Be careful. <laughs> lock it into the root stock. I'm gonna box the bandage with you. <laughs> well, so we hopefully have a. A cut that's very similar, and that looks pretty good, you see. And uh, so we're going to make this a cut in this, a tongue in the in the rootstock, uh, so that when we slip it together, it'll be just right. But I guess I should be pointing out that we're trying to match the layer right between the wood and the bark with the layer between the wood and the bark on the rootstock. If you're matching the outside, that's not going to work too well. 
you, because the uh, bark you see is much thicker here than it is on this piece that's been in the refrigerator and probably dormant. So we're trying to match under the bark, not the outside. And that, um, it doesn't have to match perfectly all the way along. If it crosses in a place or two, that's pretty good. Um, I'm pretty happy with that. So we're going to tie it. very tight <coughs> and uh, some grafters many grafters most grafters don't use this tape they use a uh, about two inch wide or inch and a half or whatever wide um, plain old masking tape but I am not comfortable with that I want to pull it up real tight to demonstrate how to tie the green tape I will put a second layer on First, put the end of the tape under the first few loops of tape, then tuck the finished end under the top loop and pull tight. Cut the loose end. Okay, so now to tie it off, we just go through there. And up into it. So, so that is, uh, <coughs> that's um, pretty much it. Now, we, then we will Put a little, little gum of, of black on top, and as soon as that dries, in a couple hours, you paint it white. And that white is very, very important if the weather should turn off hot. If it stays cool, it's not too important. So I like to paint it white just as quick as I can. As these grafts grow, the green tape needs to be cut so that it will not girdle the graft. I do this by making small cuts in the tape after about 12 inches of growth. I will show you with a marker where I cut the green tape. I do it so that the green tape is perforated and as the tree grows, the tree will break through easily, but the tape will support the graft until that happens. If you are using the masking tape, you would not have to make these cuts. We keep all the rootstock sprouts off in this upper area. And uh, keep any rootstock sprouts down low here, you keep them quite short. Now, there's some difference of opinion there. On the planting in the spring and grafting the same spring, the people that are successful believe that you must keep all the sprouts off all the time. Uh, you don't let them grow at all. And some people even believe that with an established tree that you keep all the sprouts off all the time. And I inclined them kind of lean that way. So, so then again, uh, oftentimes when the buds start out, they'll have a nut on there too, and then they'll stop and mature up two or three buds, and two or three buds will start out. And so if you want to get maximum growth on the one, you pinch the tip out of the other, just leave one go and uh, you tie it about every foot uh, with the green tape during the summer. Yeah. Great fun for grafting an apple tree. <laughs> <laughs> Thousand years. That's not yours. Not me. Grafting a lemon on a potato? Yeah. <laughs> Does someone answer any questions? <laughs> I wondered if we wanted to show the pictures you bought. Oh, maybe I can talk about the pictures. Okay, so go ahead and shut this down for now. How, how thirsty are these trees? Thirsty? Yeah, do they need a lot of water? Uh, a young tree like that, what would you say, about 50, 30 gallons a week? Yeah, something like that. 30 to 50, depends on your soil. If your soil holds the moisture, <coughs> 30 gallons is fine, but if not, you probably a little more, and maybe more after. If you got gravelly soil, you need water. Uh-huh. Yeah. When they're little. Yeah, when they're little.